All right, great. Thanks, Nick. I appreciate it. Uh, well, uh, for anybody that's watching, my name is uh, Dan Fedrosi. I'm the offensive coordinator um, up at Northern Michigan uh, University. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to come on here and you know talk briefly. Um, I will try to keep this as, as brief and to the point um, as I can. Um, if you you're watching this and maybe you <clears throat> ever ran into me recruiting down that way, uh, you know I can talk. So I will try to move myself along um, and be to the point as, as best as I can. Um, you know, the first thing I want to say is, you know, I, I just hope everyone's safe out there. This is a unique time. You know, this is really a challenge on everybody's uh, ability to adapt and, you know, overcome and you know, deal with some adverse situations. And really, at the end of the day, that's football. Um, kind of what's happening right now and our university has been shut down and, you know, working on following the guidelines as best as we can, but it's really forced a lot of these visual, uh, virtual and uh, digital learning sessions. And I think they're fantastic. You know, you want my opinion on it. Um, I hope this is something that continues. I think, you know, between Nick and some of the other people, I've had a chance to, you know, talk on a presentation that are setting these things up. That, that's, you know, kudos to them. Great job by them. This is, this is awesome. Now someone can come and watch at their leisure um, as opposed to kind of be constricted to the ability to come up um, to whether you know to northern Michigan and watch a practice well now that we've all kind of learned this element a little bit better we could do this more um, so kind of my, my second thing is, is my contact information will be on all of my slides as you see here both my email and myself you know you can reach out to me directly um, not a problem uh, at all it should be on all of my slides so as you're watching this if you just want to jot it down uh, and reach out to me feel free um, I'll, I'll certainly respond to you as quick as I can like I said, even if it's set, setting something like this up, we've all become a little more familiar with it, and we're all hoping for a season this uh, this upcoming fall. Definitely seems like it's getting there, but let's all make the, the wise decisions and doing the best we can to make sure we get that season. That's kind of my, my opinion on it, my focus. Um, so, again, just kind of want to reiterate, hope everyone's safe out there. Everyone's doing a um, good job taking care of their families and, you know, kind of putting their teams in as best a position as you can. But this is, this is going to challenge us all. I, I think this is great. You know, I was – in high school, um, at a really strong program in the lower peninsula of Michigan, um, in the late nineties. And then my senior year was 2000 and, uh, things have drastically changed since then. This has almost got a feeling of bringing it back in my, in my opinion, it's never going to go all the way back, but there's an element of bringing this thing back to just football. You know, me and Nick were talking a little bit before about how recruiting has changed. And there's not going to be any camps this summer. In my, in my opinion, that's not the end of the world. It's, it's tough on the kids. Um, I feel for those seniors that don't get the opportunity to get in front of as many eyes. Um, but it just kind of um, gives us a chance to evaluate just the player and talk to high school coaches. And when I remember my, my time coming out of high school, which you get a long time ago, you know, I'm talking about 20 years ago now, um, times change, times adapt. People have to adapt, but same time, trust in high school coaches, uh, trust in people who really know the players and watching their films, ultimately what it comes down to, you know, and uh, I, I don't think it needs to be uh, the end of the uh, world as far as things like recruiting and these kids having a great senior season and hopefully leading their team to a state championship. So with that kind of being said, again, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm, I'll be make myself available as best as possible during this time. Uh, we're navigating this like every other program and hoping to get cranked up here in, uh, you know, either uh, late June, July or August uh, with our team. But until then, I'd be more than happy to talk to anybody about anything. Um, I chose to, you know, talk about creating space in the vertical passing game. Um, this is a topic that I feel pretty uh, strongly about that you can really dive into. And this is going to be a lot less about like what Northern Michigan does or what I've done in my past, but it's actually going to maybe just open your mind up to some thoughts. Okay. This is, this will probably be one of the most complex issues, at least from my standpoint that I've maybe talked on with these virtual clinics. So again, if there's questions, which I'm sure there's going to be, um, just reach out to me and I'll help to clarify that. Um, so with that being said, I don't know how many people are going to be fired up about this. Everyone wants simple and everybody wants their kids to play fast. I get that. The, the reason I wanted to talk about this is there's two things. Okay. When I was uh, coming up as a young college coach, I was a graduate assistant at Grand Valley. Okay. And worked under Chuck Martin and Todd Colster. And you know, Todd Colster really taught me everything I know um, about the vertical passing game and what we were able to do successfully led us to a division two national title in 2006. And we lost in the semis the next year in 2007, a great run for that program. Still, still a great program. Um, but the vertical passing game was really everything. We had a great quarterback. Um, we had a great receiver, really, really dominant offensive line. I mean, everything you could ask for. And we were just able to overwhelm people, you know, and Chuck used to say it more than anything. Why take the five yarder when you can throw the 75 yard touchdown. Okay. 
but there's something that comes back to that and it comes back to recruiting. Okay. Now, if you're able just to recruit the best players and you're able to get, you know, players that are better than everybody you play every week, then you can literally do whatever you want. Okay. I've been a part of that one time in my career, really that time at North uh, at uh, Grand Valley uh, state. And then I did spend two years at North Dakota state before they got really good. We were not, uh, not, not at the echelon they are now. We kind of started that in 2009, 2010. Um, and we were able to recruit great players there, which, which again, between the coaching and the recruiting um, is why those two programs have, have been very good. Okay. But every program has different, unique um, uh, nuances, and especially at the high school level when you're not able to recruit. Okay. I'm not, not going to go down that can of worms and how those things work about getting kids into your district. But the reality is, you know, a lot of times you just kind of get what you get. So to just settle for the fact that I don't have better players. I think you got to start going down the road of being a little complex. Um, at least consider it, at least dive into it, at least say to yourself, okay, I just can't throw jump balls all the time. So how can I make this vertical pass game get as much as possible? That was really kind of where I started looking at it when I left Grand Valley. Um, spent a year as an assistant coach down at the University of Arkansas, Monticello. We had a great, great season. I went up to North Dakota State. And then um, before I came here to Northern Michigan, I was at Saginaw Valley State University. Um, with the head coach who's now currently the offensive coordinator at Dayton. So if there's anybody uh, locally, he's a good um, resource, Jim Collins, a good guy. And we did a great job with our vertical passing game. And early in our career together, we were not crazy complex. We had a great receiver kid who got drafted and a great quarterback from Westerville South, John Jennings. And again, we could kind of do whatever we want as we lost those guys to graduation. We had some injuries those next couple of years. We weren't as good in the vertical passing game because we didn't, we didn't have the better players. Um, so we kind of started getting a little bit more complex. Um, and those are kind of some of the things that I'm going to talk about that'll create options for you to dive into. Um, so hopefully that'll, you know, kind of give you guys an idea of where I'm coming from. I have a PowerPoint and then I'm going to try to bounce back and forth, um, to some film that I have. So hopefully I can navigate this, um, pretty well as we get there. We use a little bit different platform here at Northern Michigan. They're all pretty much the same. Um, but I'm going to kind of go over these PowerPoint slides and just kind of dive into some details about them. You know, the first thing you're trying to do in vertical pass games, you're trying to create vertical space. You know, there's a couple of different, um, you know, topics of space that I'm going to talk about. Everybody wants space. You know, the, the big buzzword right now or buzz statement is speed and space. Okay. That's great. Speed and space is fantastic. I love it. I was part of a spread offense multiple times. We're a little bit more of a pro style offense here, but every offense has to have an element of spread in there. I mean, it's just the nature of it. You know, whether you need to be third down, um, whether you need to be in a uh, up-tempo uh, two-minute situation, you got to be able to spread out and get, get the ball going. Um, so that's always going to be an element of speed and space that's just going to be natural to anything. But the space that I'm kind of talking about is what we're trying to create in the vertical passing game. Um, the, the first and most simple to me is always going to be stretching the third level. Um, I, I wrote this down as my first kind of bullet point, the most basic, standard, and simple. It's really the way I was taught the vertical passing game. Um, it's a very traditional read. It's kind of one-sided, especially if you're a two shelf, which I'll, I'm going to dive into all this stuff as we get going here and show you some film on what I'm talking about. Uh, but you're kind of on one side, especially versus the two shell. Um, the vertical press that I'm kind of talking about is, is that's where you're really trying to run vertical and then read those third level defenders. You know, you're reading the safeties. You're not really so worried about the second level guys. You're not worried about the linebackers. I mean, not worried about the Sam linebacker as far as in any kind of a read or really worrying about affecting them in the concept, to be honest with you, it's running four dudes down the field, reading one of those third level defenders and trying to at least find the best space or take the best matchup. Okay. Maybe it's more complex than that, but that was kind of the beginning part of the way I learned from, from both Todd and just kind of in the, the day and age of the, the game as I was kind of coming up in the college programs that I was a part of. Okay. Now, when you talk about that vertical press, you know, I'm going to kind of dive into what I call, you know, lateral space. Okay. You can kind of start creating switch routes and you can start switching those guys up. That's going to create the lateral space that I'm going to talk about kind of as I dive into the second uh, portion of my space. I wrote in the word dive releases. You know, sometimes if you're going from outside in, people call it a dive release. Um, I have at times we, we do a little bit here. Um, but you can create both vertical press and lateral space in some of our switch routes and dive releases, which I'm going to uh, dive into at the end. Um, kind of stretching the second level with vertical space. You know, this is going to be a little bit more of a high-low element. I think, you know, how you're going to involve your back is really crucial on this. And it also is kind of something that I'm focusing on with the, you know, the outside receivers. Okay, I will, again, show it this and kind of explain it a little bit better, hopefully, when I have film. 
uh, to show you. And I'm not saying we did the world's best job um, of doing that even when I show you our film, but I'm gonna talk you through what we're trying to get to, what we're trying to do with our program here. And then I also have, again, using the switch releases to both vertical press and stretch that second level. They really attack those linebackers, really attack that Sam linebacker and any corners that may be kind of playing in that soft position. So those are kind of the first, um, the most basic um, approaches to a four verticals for all intents and purposes um, that I learned that I'm gonna kind of talk about that I think you can utilize. Um, I would again use, say this approach is probably the most simplest. Um, kind of diving on top of this, you know, there's a couple of things I have issue with in the, in the vertical passing game. I don't think I actually added it onto these slides, but it's going to make me think about it as I'm talking about it. Number one, coverages have changed drastically in the last 10 years. Okay. When I was starting as a graduate assistant, when I was playing, okay, there was so much more cover three and hard cover two, you know, whatever you want to call it. Tampa was, you know, big. Um, for a lot of the four or three teams, but even, you know, people would roll those corners up and try to fit them and run fits. Okay, I was a part of a defense uh, that did that. The safeties have to get over the top. Okay. That's again, where you're just kind of reading that shell. Okay. You're reading the shell as you see it. And you could also use um, landmarks to help identify that guys would start on the hashes and they would never really squeeze inside the hashes. That would indicate to you a cover two shell. Okay somebody is less than 10 and the other safety is hanging inside the um, hash, he's probably gonna roll to the middle or they just align literally right in the middle, okay? That is kind of gone. You don't see that very often. I can't speak to what all you, um, you all see in your programs on a given Friday night, but you see so much more quarters, okay? And I'm gonna kind of really dive into that when I talk about this lateral space and that, that's really what I'm talking about. So when I'm watching film for about 10 year span, I'm like, these rules are challenging on the receivers. When I was a receivers coach at Saginaw Valley, um, I had a really good player and he was able to make a lot of plays on his own. But as I, as he graduated and, and we didn't have as much speed when he graduated, we had good players, we didn't have as much speed. But the reality was I was sitting here looking at these rules and where they're attacking and landmarks and all this stuff and they just didn't work matching up as much anymore. So you started talking about 14, 15, uh, 16, 17, 18 was kind of my second half of my, uh, my eight years at, at Saginaw Valley and you're starting to see so much more quarters for people that want to defend the quarterback run game and just the way you attack in four verticals not to mention the safeties are kind of squatting on where you're going to make your breaks it created a lot of like everything wasn't as clear as it was with the old school safety barreling off the hash bender it's it just things got so much more cloudy and really a lot of things that I'm going to talk about mostly with um, the lateral space is going to be to answer some of these things. And it's going to probably even get more challenging and more complex, but hopefully it gives you guys something to think about. But again, anyways, to kind of go back to my original point, you know, when you're just talking about pushing that third level, you're just going to kind of read those safeties pre-snap and you're just going to kind of live with it and you're going to roll with it from there. You got to see, you know, you got to see roll at the, at the snap talk about that in a minute but the reality is you're just reading those safeties pre-snap then you're going one to possibly two you know your tag receiver to the outside if you get a two shell um, if you get a one shell you're obviously just reading the two inside guys um, I, I put this on here the other thing that I'm going to talk about is really the, court, the tailback check down um, how your protection fits in with your four verticals I think is a huge talking point for any staff to really kind of um, discuss what they want to do if you want to run the old school four verticals I scanning your back and keeping him involved in the protection good to go okay that I, th I think that's probably the best way to do it um, if you talk now about stretching the second level you're going to bring in some of those elements of creating more lateral space and that's you know using the tailback um, doing different things to move those underneath uh, defenders to almost you know create high lows on Mike linebackers or possibly Sam linebackers and really you're using the element of pushing the third level to stretch the second level laterally and create sp space and more of a mid-low range, okay? So there's vertical space as far as what we're trying to do, how we're trying to attack it, but then there's also the element of showing them that vertical space to try to get the second level defenders out of there. When you talk about, you know, my point B here, I think hots are really crucial in this, in this situation when you're trying to move second level defenders, when you're given the element of the vertical press Okay, trying to get them to get out of there and run by people. And if you can now just kind of turn inside and go hot, I think it's crucial. And, and again, I'll throw Coach Collins' name out there. Again, I, I, 
we in 11 and 12 and 13, I thought we were one of the best hot teams that I'd ever been around. I think he has an extremely simple way of coaching it. Um, I've taken that and brought it up here. And I think going hot is really something you should be looking for, in my opinion. Now, you go down this road of hots and wanting to find hots, you can go down a little bit of a, um, a rabbit hole. And that's where I think people kind of get lost and they just want to scan and vertical press and just try to work that vertical space and attack those third level defenders and not even worry about those second level uh, defender guys. But if you want to talk about stretching that second level, especially laterally and create that space in the mid to low range, I think you've got to really be ready to go hot to create some great space uh, to get the ball down to generally pretty fast guys, you know, receivers and possibly a tailback. You know, if you have a good tight end, there, there, there's opportunities. There, there's even more space there than gashing something on inside zone. Um, so um, that's kind of that vertical space that I'm talking about. You want to try to push people back. You want to try to get back people back on the on their heels and or run by them. I mean, ultimately, the, the, the goal is to try to run by and score a touchdown. You know, again, going back to Chuck's statement, why take five yards when you can get a 75-yard touchdown? You know, why throw a hitch when you can just throw a 75-yard touchdown? Well, yeah, absolutely. If you've got those guys, if you have – you know, a better team than just throw 75 yard touchdown. But I have been in a couple situations of that and a couple situations I have, um, haven't always been in. I put together this, um, I, I put together this, I guess, I guess it's a PowerPoint and I'm going to run it here. I went faster than I thought. Um, I'm going to talk about now show this as best as I possibly can, you know, really all I'm talking about just to kind of clear it up. And again, it already ran, so I'm going to kind of run it again here, is I've now got a two-shell look. And, and again, this is something that I can really dive into more if someone wants to reach out individually, the whole one-shell, two-shell thing. That's probably another can of worms that, for me personally, that we may not have time to talk about. Um, that's kind of where a lot of people may disagree with me on, you know, kind of how to view it and how to read it, and that's, that's totally fine. But really kind of the standard old-school reading your pre-snap safety two-shell look this is kind of what I'm talking about, that third level stretch. I am trying to scream off the ball. Those were supposed to be tagged together. I must have kind of messed that up. Okay, so I've got this receiver here who may be my tag guy. And I, you know, I'm using this as my hashes. And obviously, if the safety works off the hash, he's here now. Okay, the ball's going to go right here. That's my number one read. Okay, he's my tag guy. That quarterback gets in his drop. That safety pushes for width. Let's see if I can do it one more time. It kind of goes in sections here. As he pushes off to get over top of that, number one outside receiver i go to my number one read who should be on a bender and in this picture right here you see a great lane between the quarterback and where the ball is going to go i'm going to talk about that a little bit later when i discuss you know let's say a word like line of sight at the end of the day i've always just been trying to get my receivers in a position of line of sight okay i always tell them listen the entire goal is to have the ball between you and the quarterback and then it's up to you if you can make a play okay making a play with a defender Okay, between the quarterback and you is, is a bad, is a recipe for disaster. Okay, so right here, you can see a good line of sight. Okay, that safety, again, show it one more time. That safety has worked off of the hash. Okay, and then our number one read is kind of bends in there to a landmark, whatever you see fit. You know, we work minus two, some people work minus one, some people run a skinny post. I, whatever you want to do, I could really care less. Really, it's kind of getting the same spot. The only thing you don't want to do is drag into this other receiver on these third level old school vertical stretch reads. But there's a good line of sight right there. Okay, but again, I'm not really worried about the second level defenders in this old school deal. Either it's a, I don't want to say it's a lob shot, but you're trying to put the ball down here. Okay, so the receiver can catch it and maybe score a touchdown. If you do try to dot him in the face mask, that's where you kind of bring the mic into play a little bit. But in this third level stretch, I'm trying to create space at the third level. I am trying to push them vertically, make it as simple as possible on my receivers. And if that safety pushes off the hash, I'm bending it. Now, as I go to my next one, I think I have the safety uh, hanging vertical. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about a one shell look. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to that one if I missed a, a slide. Maybe I didn't save that other slide. Okay, so now, again, you're talking about safety rotating to the middle of the field. Now you're working your two inside verticals, and they're going to generally stay outside the hashes. Okay, we could talk more about landmarks in a, in a more, you know, one-on-one -on -one, uh, meeting if anybody would like. Okay. But I've got those two receivers stretching that third level vertically, trying to maintain as much lateral space as is possible. That's where those landmarks come into play. So again, about two yards outside the hash, 18 yards down the field is, is a standard operating procedure. I think the NFL may be at like 20 and three or something. They're, they got tighter hashes. High school, you may want to be on the hash. Heck, I don't know. You run right down the hash, wherever you feel is best. But you want to maintain enough spacing 
okay, laterally to make sure that this high hole safety now can't play both. That, that's obviously the whole point of what you're getting to. Okay, but again, let me go back to this. Okay, so what, sorry, sorry guys. When I run this again, you just, you see rotation, but you don't see people line up a lot just like this, okay? So much more commonly, you're gonna see, you see the second level read now, you see quarters looks where people maybe roll the snap and work with action or they play flat footed. What I'm kind of talking about and the old school read where if this guy stays right on the hash, he works to accept, let's see if we can do this. He works to accept that vertical receiver. So he stays over top of your number one read. That ball is going outside all the time, hundred percent of the time in kind of the old school read that I know. And it's either about him running by that corner or if you want to run stop routes. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about that when I kind of jump to um, the film that I wanted to kind of get to. Okay. So when you're kind of talking about the, well, again, I'm, I'm using the word old school and I, you know, I've been coaching since 2006. So I guess this is year like 14 for me. I don't know if that makes me part of, you know, being a little bit older or still young. I, I don't know. But when I learned it, this is really all we focused on. There wasn't much more to worry about. And then as people started running so much more quarters, you just didn't see this very much. But here's where my mind kind of went, okay? If I get a one shell, I'm reading the two inside verticals to a possible dropout. You know, I generally want to sweep across with my reads. But if I get a two shell, now I'm just on one side and the other side's kind of dead, okay? That always kind of uh, triggered to me. I didn't, I didn't love that, you know, because of all the combo coverages that we see and because of just the straight quarters where people are going to line up to formations, which I'm going to talk about in another slide. So it got me kind of thinking about how can we manipulate, you know, for verticals, what can we do to make sure that hopefully we put ourselves in the best possible uh, situation for success. So the first couple of clips that I'm going to show you, and I hope this is running pretty well, this is now actually going to show you where this safety is staying vertical. Okay. And I always remember, you know, in, in coach Collins, we had an unbelievable passing attack. We were, I think one of the best in the country, in my opinion. And again, a lot of it had to do with players. I'm not taking anything away from the players, boys. Okay, I'm not going to do that. But the reality is it was, it was pretty simple. And that safety hanging, working vertical right there, that ball is outside 100% of the time. And as the receiver coach, both myself and then our other receivers, we'd always kind of talk about wanting to work that middle a little bit more. You know, how could we, you know, um, dictate to ourselves, finding some other open guys. And again, it was more of a philosophy thing with coach Collins and that's fine. You know, and when we, when we executed it, well, we were unbelievable. Now this corner makes a nice play. Okay, but you can see, remember what I talked about. This is a missed throw by the quarterback. Do you want to throw a five-yard uh, completion or do you want to throw a 65, 70-yard touchdown? Now, this corner makes a hellacious play, but that receiver is by him. That's the right read. He's got a good matchup. This is third-level space right here. We're creating vertical space. This kid was not very fast. This is an extremely slow player. Okay, love Ryan. Okay, he's a good senior for us last year. But I, he might have been a five-flat guy. He may not have been able to break five flags, especially at the uh, about this part of the season. He runs right by this guy. Look at the pressure he's putting on that corner. He's gotten him spinning around. That was a good player. Okay, this safety's got to hang because he's playing more of a quarters alignment. Okay, this receiver actually gets knocked down. And when he gets knocked down, he gets off the hash and tries to go make a play. He's nowhere near. If that ball is six inches ahead, great play by the corner. Got to give this kid credit. If that ball is six inches ahead. If this receiver is able to catch it like this, I don't know if this kid's going to walk into the end zone for a touchdown because, again, he's not doesn't have the speed. But if you've got a 4-6 kid, that's going to that's a walk-in end. That's what Eric Fowler used to catch at Grand Valley when I was a graduate assistant for wide-open touchdowns. And we would just heave the ball down the field, and we'd be, you know, throwing for 400 yards a game, and everyone's like, oh, you guys are so dynamic in what you're doing. This is what we were doing. Super simple. But, again, in this situation, our quarterback has to be pinpoint because this kid doesn't have the speed to really separate when that ball was thrown, so he feels like he has to drop it in a bucket. Okay, so again, kind of going back to, you know, what, how, how do you want to, you know, affect the game? And, the, and for us, we didn't affect the third level very well. We didn't have the speed to really do that. Okay, I've got another one here for you where we actually, you know, do a nice job of catching the football. So again, a two by two, more of a spread alignment. And we are working down here again to the bottom. Same deal. Look at this. And this is kind of what I'm talking about. This is where I look at these types of concepts. I'm going to pause it here for a quick second. I'm going to slow it down. I started looking at this and saying, okay, I think there's more to evaluate here. Whether you choose to do more is up to you, but this receiver in the inside is pretty open. This is what I, this is what I would talk about with line of sight. I agree with the quarterback here and the way I learned it from both my first couple of years of coaching and what coach Collins taught us. And, and I don't know what he's teaching at Dayton. Now you'll you know, have to reach out to him, but this is the correct read. That safety was vertical. Take your matchup at worst. 
We chose to keep this thing locked. The kid goes up and makes a play. Okay, and he couldn't do this um, enough this game. We didn't, we didn't score enough points in this game. But you can see right there, this is correct. This is the correct read. Okay, but because of this defender, he's, he's kind of out of it. Well, he looks pretty open to me. And if he were to catch it, now maybe if he catches it, that safety, maybe if he's catching the football right now, the safety's obviously going to drive on him. But what if he breaks that tackle? He got a chance to score the football. Okay, and so this is where I start looking at four verticals, and I think it's mostly because of the quarter's coverage. I think there's more to it. I really do. I think you want to look at it more than just stretching the third level because to me, everything that I know, this is correct. The safety is vertical, not getting off the hash. The ball goes out here 100% of the time, okay, in the way that I've learned it. And you can have good success doing it. We had success here on this specific play and the play before we could have. So, again, anything can work. I'm going to make that very clear. Anything can work if you um, emphasize it, okay? Now, here's what I want to talk about as far as you know, carrying over the slides that I already showed you, kind of that one shell read. This is, again, what defenses are doing a phenomenal job of doing. They're holding their um, alignments and spinning late. We did get pressure here, and they spun to a one shell late. But look how good of a job these uh, defenses are doing as far as hiding it. Initially, you would think they're going to rotate the other way. Look at this high safety who's kind of sitting right on the 40-yard line. And then you've got the other one who's down. Okay? They try to rotate away. Our quarterback does a phenomenal job. We should have the back blocking. And we were a scan protection here. Okay? So the back is actually working over there. He just didn't flash his eyes. We should be fully protected here. 100% protected. And we caught them working away. Line of sight for that quarterback and the receiver. Easy completion. And again, I would have loved to have seen it on the run. Okay? So now instead of a ball back here, the ball right here, he's now got a chance to defend himself off that high safety. So that is the next step. That is just, to me, that's repetitions and that's work, but I'll take this. We were running a shutdown out here, okay? But again, right now, because of the one shell rotation at the snap, we're working inside to inside. And in this case, we would be working across because of who's tagged. So you have another dropout over here. You guys can see is actually pretty open. I'm gonna dive into that just a little bit later um, as well. That's kind of what I'm talking about with as far as attacking those second levels while using the four verticals concept where, you know, I kind of view this as attacking the second level. Okay. So again, those are things I can clear up if anybody wants to follow up with me on this, but there you go. That's a nice job. But again, what you don't see that you used to see 15 years ago is no one lines up just like this anymore. So your quarterback has to be ready to read that on the fly. So initially because of this look, okay, and this is where, again, my mind started going to, okay, how can we continue to develop this to make it even more efficient not easier, not going to lie to anybody in this talk and say, I, I, I'm trying to find something or get you to think about something easier. I'm not having that conversation right now. This conversation is actually about complexity. All right. If you don't want to hear that, that's fine. I'm not going to stop anybody or argue with anybody about what they want. But my initial read because of the two shell look right now. Okay. If you remember that screen is one to two, but once they roll, now it's one to two. And that's even in this, Old school way, the way I learned it. Okay, now maybe you could identify that early enough. Great. Okay, I'm not going to take anything out away from you. The game's happening fast. That's a lot happening. So you're already down the road of things being pretty complex. So you might as well go down the road, at least to consider it. I'm going to be honest with you guys. Okay, if, if, if that's complexity, and I had to, I probably had to pause this two or three times until I really realized pre snap which way they were rolling. How can you sit here and tell me it's a completely balanced defense? How can you tell me which side they're going to roll to? I mean, the reality is they bring both edge guys and they cop the middle linebackers out. So who's to say the safety is going to roll right versus left? Why? You don't know what which one of those middle linebackers they want to have match up. Okay, so when you're attacking that third level, there's complexities to it all as is. I don't care what anybody tells me. There's going to be times your quarterback is going to miss and you're going to say, oh, it's supposed to be easy. You're just, you know, worrying about the four receivers. You're attacking safeties and pushing corners. It's that easy. No, it ain't that easy. I don't care what anybody tells me. And that's where I... Um, started kind of going down the road of, of just a little bit more complex uh, parts to it. Then I think I have one more of this basic safety read. This will actually kind of start um, talking a little bit about how to use the back, which will be one of my last topics. Okay, again, you've got a pretty standard looking two shell right here. All the indicators are there. Both guys are pretty darn close to the hatch. It's my number one old school tip off. Both guys are playing flat-footed, starting to kind of indicate to me more of a quarters than an old-school cover two, okay? The safety to the top is a little bit deeper. It might be more like a half-field coverage. But there you go. Okay, so if you're going with the old-school read, okay, this receiver should be bending it in there. You've got a chance for line of sight. He doesn't bend. Quarterback doesn't like it. He's forced to take his matchup. Okay, you don't really have much of an opportunity for this guy. 
where you don't really have much of an opportunity for this guy. They're kind of dead. And that, that was always kind of the way I learned it. Now, maybe some people have a different way to teach it. Fantastic. You know, I'd love to hear that uh, presentation as well. Okay. So when you're kind of talking about initial two shell reads, if they don't move, you're kind of locked into one to two to possibly find in your back. But if you want to really push that third level and create space down the field, you want to keep your back in. That was actually something me and coach Collins got into pretty well um, as far as looking at it and, and, and having the reason for scan protection is to be wanted to push the ball down the field. We didn't want to have a bunch of check downs. If we're calling verticals, we want to get the ball down the field. And then, so we would use our scan protection um, a, a good bit. Uh, to make sure we could push the ball down to one of those four vertical guys. But you can actually see right here. Now we're going to kind of start diving into that space of the second level. That is a pretty good amount of space created. Easy line of sight and a lot of room for that kid to work, depending especially on what the SAM does. Okay, so that's kind of what I'm talking about as far as that two-shell look where you're kind of limited. Now, again, the ball should really be going in here. Middle field's open. He's getting getting depth. He should be going in there. Excuse me, whether the ball goes in there, I don't think that's where the read the way I was taught it, um, we should take it. The ball should go outside. The receiver should be going in there. The ball necessarily should not be going in there. If the kid just makes a play, well, maybe don't yell at him. Kid goes up and makes a play here against one of the premier defenses in the country. Um, and and, and they, they took it to us pretty good, but the reality is um, that's kind of that old school attack, the third level um, approach. I want to transition now to okay, lateral spacing. And this is probably where I'm going to lose some people. Um, there's a couple of different things that I'm going to focus on in my next couple of slides. Number one, and I can't remember if these match up exactly with like A was the first slide. I figured out how I set this up, but using condensed set and FIB sets. Actually, this is the whole purpose for me looking at four verticals in a different scope. Okay. Because of what I said earlier about quarters coverage primarily aligns to formations. Okay. You see it right there. That's going to throw off some field landmarks no matter what anybody tells you. I'm going to have a safety lined up in the middle of the field. If people can talk about that umbrella and that shell, well, you still have to read snap, roll it to snap. So if you're reading roll it to snap, then you really don't know what it is. Okay. So what happens when you have condensed sets and FIB sets is you have to read that on the fly, which you're doing anyways. Okay. And this is again where I kind of lose some people. People want to make determinations at the snap and say, okay, I got a two shell coverage which that was another thing that used to drive me nuts. You know, I'll talk about that in a minute. I don't want to fall off my film um, film here in a minute. I want to make sure I get back on track. But when I start to work for my vertical landmark, if I'm a aligned inside the hash because I'm a tight end and so is that safety, I'm going to open the middle of the field. You can create some great lateral space. This is exactly what I'm talking about. But people are going to align in the middle of the field. Okay, there's going to be a dude in the middle of the field and you're going to have to work him at the snap. Well, you're doing that if they roll anyways. Okay, you have to see all that at the snap. So why not do that in the whole thing? Okay. I really believe in using your check downs. Okay. Again, we I've been a part of scan protection. Heck, we do it here. Okay. Um, we did it at Saginaw Valley because Coach Collins wanted to push the ball down the field. I wanted to push the ball down the field because I was coaching the receivers at the time. We had a really good one. But the reality is finding that back is a dynamic element that if you you know, obviously, you know, Tom Brady's the greatest ever and the teams he's been a part of, but him finding those back is man pretty good now you have to push the ball down the field to be able to get some space with that back um, or else they're just gonna sit on the back and throw it to them every single time um, but the reality is a lot of times those second level defenders turn and run find the check down on the back that's a great opportunity um, and then the burst where is he going and then what's that sam doing okay so if you're bursting that back and you want to try to find him there is a ton of space to the field especially if corners turn their back and run sam's try to get for a ton of width underneath that uh, drop out to the uh, field. A lot of space for that back to catch the football. And you, again, you talk about speed and space, got a really good chance right there. The last thing that I'm going to touch on is switching the back and the tight end. Um, I'm just going to kind of touch on it. I wouldn't really recommend a, you know, a huge element of it. If you don't like it, it, it doesn't change anything, but you got to have some pretty good backs. We did a ton of it at grand Valley in my time there. I don't, you know, see a lot of people doing as much of it now. They most um, people use their backs, but we were super involved in having the back get involved in our four verticals passing game. So I've always liked it. Um, I've always wanted to use it. I've got a little bit of film to uh, show you of that. Listen, the reality is the linebackers are just naturally going to widen with that back a lot of times. Okay. There's just going to be more room for that check down with the tight end because they're going to switch because those linebackers, they're, they're like moss to a flame. They just look at those backs or staring in the back or they see them move. They just naturally move with them. Okay. So there's benefit uh, to it right there. 
Okay, again, I got another couple of clips here that I'm going to try to explain what I'm talking about as far as, number one, declaring the middle of the field. Okay, I think this is crucial to it. And then using those condensed sets and then FIB or formation of the boundary sets to, to actually use to our advantage. And you look at this, and this is where it gets cloudy. But I'm saying it's cloudy anyways. So why not use that against them? Why not take advantage of their strength? Yeah, I think defenses are at a strength when they're in quarters against uh, four vertical. It wouldn't be my number one call if, you know, well, first of all, it, it probably was my number one call this past season. We were not great at it, and we played too much coverage. I, I learned a, a valuable lesson. and I went into it knowing that I still didn't execute it very well. But the reality is if you're going to get a ton of this, four verticals isn't the best concept there is to if you don't have just dominant players, okay? There's probably other things you want to do to set up four verticals, but let's just say you want to work this. You want to get good at it. You want to follow these, you know, lateral spacing rules that I'm going to kind of talk about. Then uh, here's kind of hopefully a way to explain as best as I can. I think you've got to declare the middle of the field. Okay. And this is what I'm talking about. Look at where that safety is aligned. I'm going to circle them with my mouse. Hopefully you guys can see that he's aligned there because of the tight ends alignment. We have FIB alignment here. I want that. I want to put them in this bind. But the middle of the field is closed. There's a dude in the middle of the field. And how do you know he's not going to stay there? How do you know you're not going to get a pretty standard spread defense uh, pressure where they bring the will into the minus B gap or they bring him off the edge to take away zone read stuff and this safety spins down. In that case, he doesn't have to move. That's perfect. Okay, I want to read those two inside guys anyways. So as we run this first one, that is actually exactly what I'm hoping for. Because look at the line of sight now you have. Instead of this receiver being way out here and collisioning this Sam linebacker and running into him, he might clear before you go and you might have a chance to make what I call a dot shot and just put it right on his face mask. And we'll talk about a few techniques that you can follow there. If this safety stays in the middle of the field. So that quarterback is looking at him anyways. And he's thinking, okay, I know that that tight end or whoever, it could be a condensed receiver for all I care, is going to push for width. That is going to get that safety to do something. Either he's going to widen with him because he's got him in quarters, man to man, or he's going to sit there because he's the high hole safety. Well, I'm staring right at that guy. I'm looking right at him. Rip the ball in there to that receiver's face mask or start working back, which we'll talk about more um, in a second. So as I go and run this one again, actually this formation and this alignment is exactly to a T why I like this kind of stuff against the, the day and age of these coverages. Okay, I want that Sam to burst and have him take away that drop out by the number one, which is generally what the rules for quarters are, hook to flat, okay? I mean, I haven't coached defense in a long time, but it's generally hook to flat. Well, if someone's in, in inside leverage, a lot of those same linebackers, sorry, a lot of those same linebackers have a hard time reaching back and then getting to the flat. They just they just can't generally do it, nor, are, nor really should they. They accept the fact that maybe the mic is going to pick them up, but the mic's looking in the backfield. He might even be looking to match the back. So when I run this again, this scenario is exactly what I'm talking about as far as creating lateral spacing. I want to move defenders laterally. I'm not as amped now to say, okay, we're going to throw the ball down the field. first. This is now more of your mid uh, to low level um, throws and completions. You might talk about it being more, um, uh, more efficient or, you know, a higher number uh, chance for you to complete it, you know, percentage, I guess, complete, higher uh, percentage pass, whatever they call it. I got line of sight, okay? Let that Sam clear. Again, he's rarely going to reach out for you. On the backside now, he's going to have to read the entire field. Here is going to be a challenge for you guys if you do this. This receiver has to read the middle of the field. He's got to see that this safety clears off that hash, and he bends it in there now. Now you've got a chance for a touchdown. I had a lot of practice film. I wasn't able to access it. I have some practice film on here. I had a lot of practice film um, from last spring. We only got one spring practice in this year. Last spring, we had a lot of film where he's kind of chasing. So let me go back and do this all together at once. He's kind of chasing this other safety. Boy, if you complete that thing, now you've got a chance to score it. Okay, you put the pressure on this safety vertically by your vertical stretch, obviously with speed. You're laterally moving these guys. Now you've really got a chance to get those guys going. Okay, you've really got a chance to create space, especially in the middle of the field, which is really where I think lateral spacing comes into play. Okay, it's not so much about pushing the ball down the field, taking your matchups on the outside. Uh, it's more about attacking the middle of the field. Okay, now when I go to the next one here. Okay, so again, I could probably talk about that element for a lot longer and show guys a lot more film. Just reach out to me, uh, text me, set up a time, and I'll show you a lot more film 
Um, but I do want to keep this thing relatively brief to move everybody along. And then you know, we all have things to do. But I also want to talk about, you know, slide B, okay, using the back in the check down. Okay, I think, again, you're talking about creating some good space. I use really that same element, okay, where that receiver is condensed. He's going to widen the SAM and that safety to clear the middle of the field. So this is my number one read. That second receiver comes over there, but this guy sits on it pretty good. It just doesn't feel good. So your quarterback is one. He don't like it. That safety's hanging. Maybe I drew this safety a little bit too deep. Maybe he's hanging. Okay. This safety right here, he starts to work back. He's working to the other middle uh, read. It's not working outside anymore because I'm creating lateral spacing. I'm moving people laterally to try to rip the ball into the middle of the field for good space. Not necessarily a touchdown, but for good space. Okay. One to two. Now we add in the back, because maybe even that linebacker took away one of those two routes. Look at all this space for the back. We've got a nice little triangle right here. That is kind of your one, two to three read, okay? This is a little bit of an of kind of just taking that outside initial, you know, basic read. And if I'm not counting on the back and kind of moving it inside. And finally, if you don't like it, you got your stop route or your vertical out here to, to, number, to your number one receiver. Now, if you're gonna really involve him, it would really be one, to two to outside receiver to find in your back if you're going to work all the way to the boundary because you want to stretch people laterally i would send your back to your last read okay i like to just keep it to the two inside guys okay not to say the outside guys are dead but depending on where the back goes so in this case with the back bursting to the screens left i don't i guess maybe you guys would look at that as left it would actually be this outside check down that would or or throw that we would be looking for okay so we're actually reading one to two, to using the check, to tailback with the check down. Look at all that space that's created because we move people laterally, especially with that initial alignment. I want to go back and show that because this is really everything. Okay, that's really a big element of trying to create some space laterally. And then you kind of create also that high low. So you create both lateral and vertical spacing. A lot to think about. Your heads are going to explode the first time you do it. First time you think about it, your kids' heads are going to explode. If you can get to an element where your kids are good at this, it's almost indefensible. I don't care what anybody tells me probably getting a lot of arguments over that okay i'm gonna come back to this later let's go back to some film here i got a little bit more film to show so now we're going to kind of go through a few clips that i think show a little bit of this lateral spacing um, element that i'm talking about okay, let's make sure i can find the right one okay first things first i talked a little bit about stretching the second level okay i think your drop dropouts and or lack of dropouts are gonna determine that. If you just wanna push the third level, keep those guys going. You see jersey number 87 dropping out, it's receiver up top dropping out. We weren't able to complete this, but look at all that space that's created. This is a little bit more of that third level vertical stretching, but I would almost view this as a second level stretch, okay? Because you're really not impacting those corners. They're just over the top. You're gonna to shut it down if you can't beat them, turn around and catch the football. Again, we just didn't execute it. The ball's thrown just a little bit low. I know our quarterback coach would talk about his drop is too deep there. I'm not going to really dive into drops. If you guys want to cover that stuff, again, we can meet up again. You can touch with our quarterback's coach and he can detail it just a little bit more um, in detail if you guys would like. But you can see right here now we're, we're running our switch routes. Okay. He's following his middle of the field rules. But look how it worked at the snap. So in this case, he's one to two. He actually should be working the dropout over here. He just got locked in. That's where you kind of start going down the road of, okay, it's already complex. Now he just needs to make the throw. I get it. You can sit here and say, well, coach, he just needs to make the throw. Well, yeah. But at the end of the day, if he follows his rules, maybe he makes the throw. You know, you got to coach rules and principles. You know, so what we talked to this kid about was, okay, your number one read, you don't like it. You work to the other one. He's not doing a great job on his release. Okay, because I don't think we're doing enough to create lateral spacing. I would like to actually take this receiver and condense his split to help to declare the middle of the field clearly and to get around that Sam linebacker easier but we should be working the dropout to Jersey number 87. And there's a lot of space to throw that to not have to worry about this uh, Sam linebacker. You could put that ball out here. It's a longer throw. He's going to have time to react to it. That's what we used to do a ton at Grand Valley when I was a graduate assistant. I thought we did a great job. Where this is a shorter throw, you feel like you've got to make it quicker. You've got to rip the ball out there because he can make a, uh, make a play on that football. So there's kind of that lateral spacing that uh, we talk about on the outside. This is actually focusing on, so I am on number six. This is talking about our switch releases. Okay, so this is also kind of wrapping up that first portion of attacking the third level and using vertical space. So switch releases are generally gonna throw off those third level defenders though as well too. People usually have stack and switch rules. 
Okay, but here's gonna kind of start diving into our lateral spacing where I kind of start thinking about it. Look at this tight end. Now, he's not the fleetest of foot guy. He's a big, tall kid and he's a great worker, okay? Kid works really hard for us. I, I think he fights and, and scratches and claws as, better, as good as anybody. But just kind of look at that picture. Okay, now they kind of had us there as far as some protection stuff. We can talk about that again later. We have it all, we have enough people to block them. Okay, it's protected pretty well. We actually have enough blockers um, for their pressures. But look at this. This is kind of what I'm talking about as far as that cloudiness of defensive coverages. Not exactly line of sight, but to me, that's a, not a bad matchup. Okay, he's taken his one to two to three. Oh, sorry, that's a terrible three, guys. And the back did get eaten up because his number one threat uh, got uh, pressured. But look at that. This is always what I would say to anybody. Okay, and this is actually, I'm looking down at my notes just to make sure I made a point on this one. This is where this whole thing starts for me. Okay, and if, I, if I've lost some people or if this is too complex, okay, call me up and let's talk about it or, or don't do it. I'm not, I'm not, it's, it's, that's fine. But what would you call that? Would you call that, you know, I, I always used to laugh. I had a coordinator I worked for one time that would call it two safeties. Okay, or one safety. You you would call that a one safety? Look, I, I wouldn't. There's not a dude in the middle of the field, so let's throw the ball in the middle of the field. It's kind of what I'm getting at. These are those combo coverages, those unique alignments that we have used our FIB set. Nobody in the middle of the field. I want to throw the ball in the middle of the field. This is where I usually kind of get into this, like people don't understand. This, well, it's a one shell. Hell, it's a one shell. There's nobody in the middle of the field. I want to throw it to jersey number 44. He's not tagged in this case. Okay, and we've made some adjustments. We've made some adaptations where we may look to bend both guys. Okay, if it's a true legitimate two shell, in this case right here, if he reads that as a two shell, he could make a slight bend right about there. That's line of sight. Imagine if he's catching the football and almost running it. I'm not going to say like a slant, but darn near like a post, hard post. He's going to his locked landmark. He's correct here. He's kind of he should just eat this guy up. Where the ball gets thrown is correct based off what we did a year ago. Okay, that is 100% correct. This was a old school vertical third level read. We were one to outside. But I want to do more stuff where you're attacking the middle of the field. Look at that. There is literally nobody. Now, if this linebacker bats it down, whatever. There's nobody between the quarterback and this guy's face mask right now. There is a guy right here that could fall into position. I want to work the middle of the field against a two shell. That's where this all comes down to. Look at this. This is a comic. There's nobody in the middle of the field. I want to take advantage of their defense. Now, I wish I had a faster player. I wish this tight end was a little bit faster so that when he made that bend, he could catch it and score it. But you're telling me this guy's going to get off the hash, okay, and stop this guy anywhere near that 35-yard line? You're crazy. We're going to get a good chance at 15 or 20 yards here if we don't score the football. Okay, but we had to throw it in that tight window because of the old-school two-shell rules. Okay, well, if that's the case, do you view that as one shell? How do you view that as one shell? And then where, where would his landmark be? Okay, I know I'm kind of going on a rant here a little bit, but if, if that's a one shell, then where would that receiver go? How does he view that as one shell? Because it's based off the formation. I, I vehemently disagree with that. And does he just stay vertical? Now you're forcing the ball here, okay? Which is kind of what I'm getting at, okay? I don't want to do that because now the ball has to go to this guy. I want to give the quarterback options. He's really got three options. If you kind of work on saying, okay, I'm going to declare the middle of the field with a condensed set, nobody in the middle of the field. Throw the ball in the middle of the field. You don't like your number one, work back to your tight end, you got 87. It's almost like viewing it as a one shell. See, you see how it's all kind of coming full circle? Probably lost some guys. If I did, fair enough. Call me and we'll talk about it. I got plenty of time in my hands. Kids go to bed about eight o'clock Eastern time. Let's do this. All right, now, the next one here is, is again, another example. We got sacked here. I hated, I hated to have to show this one. I couldn't pull up my spring uh, one practice film from this year because we had a couple of good ones. Here's another great example. How would you, how would you uh, define that? Would you call that a one shell? I just don't think so. Okay, now what I want this tight end down here to the field doing is to go faster, to clear the middle of the field. He is not tagged, but I still think he should have the ability to let both those guys bend. The middle of the field opens, slam that thing in there, at least put the quarterback line of sight. Give him a chance to big body that thing at least. If not, pressure step him and do a little bit better job of creating separate. See how gray his route is? He plays right into their coverage. Okay, so in this case right here, because of how we were again doing it last year if you view this as two shell because that safety's off the hash then he should be number one to outside where i think you want to let that middle of the field declare I, I just don't know if you would view that as a one shell or high safety coverage if you do then okay that, that's that's actually the way you want to do it but how do you know that this safety is not going to kick back here okay and if you're viewing that as a one shell coverage now i just don't think you're putting 
the tag receiver in good position. Where is his landmark? Do you keep him now on the numbers? I think you're kind of creating too many variables on the fly there. And again, we got sacked. That was kind of disappointing. But you can see what I'm talking about. Look at how that middle of field declares right there. That middle of field is opening on the fly. Now, we didn't pick this guy up. Jersey number six should block him. That's his guy. And I'm showing you a film of us not picking up protection. This isn't a protection clinic right now. Six wasn't great in pass pro. You know, you live and you learn. All right. But look at that middle of the field. A lot of space in there. Jersey number six just picks that linebacker up. 24 bends that thing in there almost on a slam post. A lot of space. Created a lot of space by moving people laterally. All right. Now, I want to talk a little bit about HOTS. Okay. I'm going to rattle through five slides. And this is going to be based off of HOTS. Um, and then also our running back checkdowns, okay, which I think are important. But I want to show just how important HOTS are. I believe very strongly in them. You don't have to do them. Okay. But we do not because of the way we set this protection up. We don't have this guy blocked. I mean, you could sit here and say the guard could molly out. We're not a big molly out team. Okay, the tackle probably should pick him up, but this is a good example of going hot. They did bring more guys than we uh, could pick up. Technically, it's this receiver that should be going hot, but I'm going to give you guys this picture as the guy that we're going to kind of focus on how going hot can work good. Technically, he's not opening the middle of the field because he's not declaring. He's not pushing that safety open the middle of the field, but he's kind of going hot on accident. He's actually making his bend based off of a two shell pre-snap alignment. Not exactly wrong, but look at how he brings that mic and he didn't create enough lateral spacing by pushing out. But this is what I'm talking about going hot. I think hots are great. Look at that line of sight. Again, we should technically have him protected. It's this linebacker. He's, I think actually he might be going hot. This kid did a really nice job here. Look at that. Nice, easy drop off. He catches the football here. And just like the receiver that does catch it, catches it for a first down. Okay, and if this receiver catches it a little bit earlier, let's say the ball's out right now because we go hot, he's got a chance to not only get the first out, but make that guy miss because he's more aware. He catches the ball, he can look, he can make a move. This receiver's catching it late. He's dragging himself too far into the middle of the field because he didn't push laterally initially, and he doesn't have any space to work with. Okay, so that's where that lateral spacing, declaring the middle of the field, and I guess more than anything, what I'm talking about is taking this receiver, he's got to push for width first. He's got to get this guy out of here. And if in the meantime, he either makes his break or goes hot, that is a lot of space. It's a lot of space for that quarterback to either find him, work to his other bender, and then work to the other possible dropout, and then the back if you were to get no pressure if you had him and checked on. But I like going hot. Okay, so in this case, we were actually working the tailback across. Okay, we should have had the tackle for him. This receiver is the one that's technically hot. Start going down the road of hots. It is a lot, I'm not going to lie. So there's one. Good line of sight there. We could have gotten it. Here's another one. In practice, we did not go hot. Okay, but this is against a little bit deeper, um, a little bit deeper safety alignment than maybe even that last picture you had. Imagine if he just kind of turned the ball inside there. Now this is third down. Again, you're going to catch it short of the stick, but you got to be able to make something happen. If you're going to bank on a 30-yard vertical jump ball to make a play, why not bank on a little short check down to make a play? But receiver didn't go hot there, wasn't locked in, so this is the challenge of going hot. We did not have our tailback scan in, in this case. I wanted to work with our guys on going hot. I'm going to touch on this in a minute when I dive into the next um, slides about hots. They're, they're tough. I'm not going to lie to anybody. We have everybody, but this outside blitzer picked up. That should be blocked technically by the receiver going hot. Quarterback's got to get the ball out of his hands. Yeah, he may get hit. I get tired of hearing that all the time. You know, he may get hit. He's going to get hit. Quarterback can't make a throw on his back, blah, 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 blah. I've seen quarterbacks throw hot if the receiver goes hot my entire career. Okay, so don't get me started on the hot conversation as far as it can't be done. It's got to be coached. If you're not going to coach it, don't do it. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. I'm not going to argue with anybody there. But at the end of the day, if this receiver turns and runs a slant, what are some of the best routes to run against man-to-man? -man? Slants, meshes, okay, rub routes. Well, guess what you're running against this pressure and against this coverage? It's man-to-man. -man. It's off cover zero, guys. You're running a slant with more space, okay? But I think he's doing a nice job of attacking laterally. He's declaring the middle of the field. He's just got to throttle down inside and go hot. Sorry, I kind of went on a rant about hots there. I believe very strongly in hots. Okay, this is another condensed set um, alignment. This is actually really important. I'm going to talk about this then. Um, I'm going to talk about the running back checks down. Here's what I've noticed about condensed sets, even more so than the FIB. This is the only good one I had, guys. So I wish I had more. We didn't do a great job of it. I'm sitting up here blabbing and talking about um, all this stuff. We, not just, we didn't do a great job of it, okay? Something we want to work on this fall. But what you're going to generally find with condensed set is the good old corner divider rules. They're not going to chase you in there. Sometimes they do. Okay. But if those corners are going to stay outside, as you push for width, as you push for your lateral spacing, you're going to start getting those corners to turn and kind of discombobulate them. Okay. On my slide, I think I, I didn't want to try to spell discombobulate because my auto check wasn't on. 
So I just throw, mess them up. But look at what you do to that corner. Just because you start tight and you push for width. Okay, now again, this is an old school vertical read. Okay, but we're using our condensed split. So that's where I think on that first slide, I said there was some carryover. You can use the lateral releasing to create lateral space and discombobulate people and use your old school third level vertical push. So we are literally in this case reading one to two in this game. Okay, we'll talk about some, some ways that might be easier to do it than we even did it last year. But look what he does to that corner. That corner initially starts turned inside. He pushes for width, he turns outside because of probably divider rules and the rules they're teaching the corner and then he throttles. That's a lot for any corner to handle. Unless you're going up against a first round draft pick or a kid that's a you know, all state, you know, top 200 kid in the state kid. Listen, the reality is that should be a pretty easy, just you should be banging that ball out to the stop route. Okay, and that's what I like about these condensed sets. Again, we didn't do enough of this. I'm not gonna lie to anybody, but this receiver did a great job of creating space laterally while using our old school vertical spacing reads. Okay, he's reading one to two. Okay, now in this case right here, the safety is getting off the hash. So he's looking for number one, but he's not bending in there fast enough. We need more speed of the tight end. So he's got to go back out to his number two to a possible late back on a check down, which I'm going to now dive into the tailback check downs. Okay, so I wanted to show this. So I got two clips of tailback check downs. I just think when you look at it, look at all this space, guys. Okay, now how you teach this tight end, teach his own. If you're going to stop him, and some people like to stop him, so that if they vacate, it's it's that high-low element that we talked about. Okay, this is again a little bit more of that vertical spacing. That, sorry, vertical spacing that we're talking about. This is not really a lateral element if you stop him. Okay, so let's just say we're reading this cat up here, which in this one, this is our number one read. Okay, if he's taken away by an underneath linebacker, so he just comes into the vision of the quarterback, find the check, find the check down to the tailback, he's just stopped. If you want a full fill read and kind of get four guys involved and go one to two, to three, to four, now you need to talk about a burst and you need to get him out of there and primarily go, sorry, that was a bad last line, going the way that the quarterback is reading. So in this case, down on the screen, okay? No good, no good, no good. Look at all that space for the back. Now, yeah, okay, easier said than done. Takes a lot of time, but we gotta work it. Just like anything else, you gotta work it. Look at all that space. I, however, I would like for him to burst, but throttle once he sees the Sam sitting there. Good old man zone rules, old school man zone rules. And he does end up finding them, but the running back drifts just a little bit too much. I would tell the quarter, the, the tailback, and I told the tailback, it needs to be a more defined route up and then out. It's gonna help with the timing. It's gonna help keep you away from this Sam linebacker if he were to sit and hold on you. But if he's turning and running, now you burst away. So I see the back of that Sam, I just keep running. I see the Sam staring at me, I throttle and find that void. So I think it matches up with a little bit more of that middle read on the lateral spacing that attacks those quarter defenses pretty good. And then that was practice and here's one in the game. Now we're getting pummeled there pretty good guys. That's a good, again, a good Grand Valley team. We got great teams in our league. I think it's one of the strongest leagues in the, in the country and they got after us pretty good. But you can see late in the game, Look at this. They were worried about us throwing the ball down the field. We're down 45-10. We've got to get the ball going. They, they're not dummies. They're running Tampa too. And look at that tailback check down. Not as defined as I would like. Some people like to run an old school like circle route. They like to almost do like this. That's fine. Okay. Or a Texas route or whatever you want to call it. But I do like how he's throttling because of what the Sam is doing. Now look at all that space he has to work with. I think he ends up fumbling this late. Okay. No, he didn't. But look at that. I think this was actually close to a 25 yard gain. Look at all that space. So this is what I'm kind of talking about. You can view that tailback as vertical spacing, but I, I think you really want to consider how you're reading it. You've got to tie him in with how you're reading it. Okay, so again, we've got starting out with a one shell. Dude right in the middle of the field. They actually roll to a two shell, okay? He should be kind of bursting just maybe a little bit closer to that umpire. Yeah, I'm not going to tell him he's wrong. we got a nice gain here. One to two to three wouldn't be a bad option to four. Okay, so even if the quarterback would rip the ball out there to the stop route, he would not have been wrong. Okay, so this is what I'm talking about as far as using your receivers to kind of create lateral spacing. You got to read it differently, though. Even against two shell, okay, you're not just going one to outside. You're going one back to the other bender, back to the other throttle or vertical if you keep them going down to your back. And that's where I think you don't want to have your back scan, okay, because I still think you're better off going hot off of this guy. So I'm going to draw an H. Hopefully you guys see a sideways H. I still think you're better off going hot on that. Imagine if you catch the football and you could easily get to the 38 there for the first time. Okay, so just a little bit different read. And that was my last uh, clip. 
So now I want to go back to my, um, I want to go back to my slides and wrap up here. But the one thing I did want to say, you can see, we called this Wisconsin a year ago. I think you want to have two different calls for two different reads. If you just want to read old school pre-snap shell, unless they roll one to outside two, I think you want to call it something different, like call that Michigan or something. So your quarterback knows it's a different read. This concept where you're kind of reading middle, middle to outside to a check down, I think is a whole different deal. And if you don't already do it, I think you'd want to call it something different. Like maybe you'd call it, you know, steamers or something uh, or, or whatever. So I, I've never argued that kind of focusing more on that lateral spacing is a, is a different approach. It's a whole different approach that a lot of times people don't um, understand. So let me kind of wrap up here. I got a couple of slides. Again, I'm not going to brush through them fast. I'm going to share my screen even one more time. And, but I do want to talk about these real quick because I think they're important um, points because I can sit here and do all this talking, but at the end of the day, there's a couple of things I think you got to ask yourself in the vertical passing game that I believe all the time get brushed over way too much. Everyone just wants to call four verticals, heave the ball down the field. That's great. Again, if you have better players, it's going to work. Okay, you can do whatever you want. I mean, why even call anything else? That would be my first statement to you. You know, if you're at one of the top programs in the state, you know, why, why do anything else? Why even call a different concept? Just throw the ball down the field. It's like three pointers in basketball. You know, you, your better percentages are better if you've got a kid, you know, that's a top commit or just a great player and he can make plays. We'll just throw the ball down the field. Why even call curl flat or smash or whatever it may be. Okay. So that's my first thing. What do you want to do and why? Okay. Why do you want to run four verticals? Is it because you want to try to find space and try to hit something on the fly and catch somebody late? Is it because you want to attack when they bring pressure? Um, that's a philosophy. Some people want to maybe check into it when they bring pressure. You know, they only got three deep. Let's send four guys at it. Um, and then that's a, that's a, that's a great philosophy, but I think you really got to think about what you want to do and why I don't think enough people think about that in the game. If I don't have a very good quarterback, heck, maybe someone's watching this and they're, you know, a triple option offense and they were hoping to find some kind of a play action. Well, we can, you call me up. We can talk about something different. I wouldn't do four verticals if you're a triple option offense, my opinion on it. Okay. Number two, what I talked about, I just, I ran it for a long time. Again, and my loss of people, but this vertical thought, the old school vertical thought and kind of what I touched about, touched on as far as trying to create more lateral spacing in the middle of the field, it may be too much. And hell, I'll tell you it's too much. Unless you guys got like 600 reps a day at NDSU, we used to get about that because we would, we, we, we kind of started the whole double rep thing. I don't know if they still do it or not. I've heard they do. Now everybody wants to do two teams back to back while we were doing it in 2009, 2010. And now they win like every game. So my thing is, do you have enough time to do it? At the end of the day, if you literally just call what, what I was tagged as Wisconsin and kind of work in the middle of the field more, there's answers in every single thing that defense can do. It's like, you, you got to work to find it. I would just call that all the time. Okay. So again, probably too much to do it all. I want to just focus on pushing the ball down the field, old school, vertical space. Let's roll. If you want to try to, I hate to use the word dink and dunk and kind of work them until you're able to um, strike, th then maybe creating some more lateral space on middle field may be able to help you. And then number three, which probably should be number one, what can your quarterback handle? I put down two um, scenarios. Maybe I've got a super cerebral kid. He's got good accuracy, but he's not, you know, he's not, he's not going to be a college quarterback. He doesn't have the arm strength, you know, this lateral approach, creating space in the middle of the field while looking like you're pushing the ball down the middle of the field or pushing the ball to the third level and being ready to attack it when it's there might help you. You might be a little bit more efficient. You might create space in the middle of the field. And if your kid can handle it mentally, then it might help you. If you've got a strong arm kid that can throw dimes, that eh, standard old school vertical passing game where you're just affecting the third level, probably going to be just as hard for anybody to defend unless they've got great corners uh, as well too, or, or safeties that can get off the hash and make a play on an outside vertical. Um, okay. Now the one thing I did want to make sure I touched on, I'm not a big advocate of, four verticals in the play action game using your running back. Okay. If you want to use four verticals in the play action game, I strongly encourage it, but I think it's just pretty much the old school. What I talked about, you're just trying to push the ball down to the field to one or two guys. We did that in that game um, in, a, in a game at the end of the season. And we had some success with it. We didn't have the speed to score the football. Uh, we didn't have the speed to really create huge explosive plays. Um, but at the end of the day in the drop back, I think the running back check down uh, is better than worrying about, um, you know, picking up people and all sorts of protection. Also, I see huge value in it. Some don't um, tomato, tomato, I guess. I've always said this. I think you've really got to look at the timing of things. And I, I put it down there. Number two, the gun can be tough because what I see a lot out of kids, especially at camps, which this is where my theory on the losing camp things this year may not be the worst thing ever is kids just sit there and bounce. 
waiting for something to get open. Okay. In your mind, that feels like a lot of time to a kid. He may be in that position one, two, three, before your receivers are even ready to make their breaks. Okay. They, unless you've got a four, six kick, especially in the middle of the field, that's got to deviate his route because he's getting you know, thrown off by a Sam. That quarterback's going to be sitting there hopping, waiting, 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 and he's probably just going to end up taking off. And I just put it on there. Why not just call a draw? To be honest with you, it just kind of drives me nuts. I think you got to look at your timing. I, that's where I believe in the under center with the four verticals because I think it times up pretty good. Some people just don't like to do it. I'm not going to stop you. You watch all these NFL guys. They pretty much live in the gun now. I'm talking about the premier of the premier. Okay, we got some good players, but we don't have Patrick Mahomes playing for us. I think you really got to think about those finite details. My opinion, again, I can argue with anybody if you, if you don't agree. Okay, and then, again, just to kind of wrap up on um, number one, the play action, you're probably going to get your back eaten up because the element is going to suck those linebackers up. It's just the nature of it. I play linebacker. They're going to see that line running back. They're going to stutter, and then they're just going to get lazy. And they may turn and drop a little bit, but they never get far enough where you think you can impact them, get them to turn around and check them. Every time I've thought that that's going to happen, it never happens. We actually did it this year. I thought, let's put it in action. So the linebackers do this, then they turn and run, and we drop it down to the back. And the linebacker sat there and ate the guy up, and our quarterback was thinking it behind the back. So foolish idea, um, in my opinion, to do play action with counting on your back to be much of an option. I think this is my last slide, and then I'm going to um, kind of short this. So, oh, no, did I did we do that? I went backwards. Okay, um, how to rep it and work it. Number one, you guys have got to call it a lot. Um, again, just a laugh going back 14 years ago or however long ago when I was at Grand Valley, like – Todd had this huge playbook and all Chuck called was verticals. They used to drive him nuts. You know, we'd have this playbook. We want to install, you know, curl flat and, you know, corner hitch route. And every day in practice, we would just call four verticals. You know, now we got good at four verticals. Okay. So you got to be able to work it. So there you go. But at the end of the day, if you don't, if you've got limited time, if you don't have the ability just to run by people, I don't know how dynamic it's going to be for you unless you call it a lot or you're two, three years in, maybe you got a sophomore quarterback who can grow into it. You know, as a junior or senior, he might just be ready and still have all the other stuff worked in um, as he works up to it. Um, but I just think the quarterback's got to be really fluid at this, especially if you're going to do things like hot, especially if you're going to do things like counter running back again, probably too much for you. But if you want to go down that road, you got to call it a lot, maybe at the expense of anything else. Um, and in my opinion, Okay, now number two, I think is a really important part to it. You got to ask for looks and pressures. And, you know, I put on there, your head coach has got to be bought in. Ours is, he's a defensive guy. So he doesn't really care if the defense, you know, loses in a drill or in a practice because he wants the team to win. But a lot of times, you know, if your head coach is, you know, maybe oversees the whole thing, you got offensive and defensive coordinator that are competitive. They don't want to lose all the time, but you've got to ask for stuff and then kind of get your kid worked into it and be like, all right, you know, we're expecting pressure today. And then he gets some and he's ready to hit that hot or he's ready to put his foot in the ground and work the two inside verticals and create that space. And the defensive coaches are going to get mad because they're like, man, you know, I'm just getting ripped on these verticals. And a lot of times you see staffs not want to do that. So you really got to be bought in as a staff to, to understand that your defense is going to lose a good bit, not all the time, but a good bit. And it's for the greater good. And you got to teach your kids to understand that because you're, Defensive line's going to be like, what the heck? And your you know, linebacker's going to be like, come on, man, cover somebody. It ain't that simple, you know? Because what's going to happen is on a Friday night when, you know, LaSalle brings pressure, and you talked about it one time in August, and you miss it, you're going to look back, you know, next morning on Saturday and be like, oh, why didn't we execute it? We talked about it on August, you know, 11th when we reported and installed it, and you're going to do the math, and you're going to be like, well, it's you know, October 12th. You know, come on now. I can't remember what I said in the first slide, let alone worry about what somebody talked about three months ago when you're 16, 17, 18 years, years old. So I, I think there's elements to, you've got to work it. You've got to ask for looks. You've got to get those looks. And then you've got to be able to teach off of that. And you got to do it a lot. Now, the last thing, and this is you know, probably getting laughed out of the uh, presentation here, but I got track it. Okay. This is literally just a cardboard or uh, a board I got from like an arts and crafts store. And you've got to track it, you know, so like we tracked how many throws, how many were versus pressure? Like, so we got a couple, okay? Um, how many of them were in seven on seven versus in team situations? We didn't do the formations thing, which I wrote that down there. I, that's something we wanted to do this year. Um, and, you know, we even got screens on here, how many times we sprinted out. Uh, and then we also even tracked our throws and then our catches. Um, you know, if I've got a same quarterback throwing four verticals for 90% of camp, well, don't be surprised when your number two quarterback isn't very good at it. We were actually pretty spread out. We don't we only had a couple quarterbacks last spring uh, he was our number one guy and we wanted to get him ready he hadn't played in a couple of years 
Um, but the reality is between the pitch count, uh, between track and throws and track and how many times you've called the concept to make it as even as possible um, to make sure that you're working it enough versus working it too much. And then also even looking, diving into even farther and looking at things like uh, formations, how many times you used motions in there. Again, I, I'll probably get laughed at, but um, that might be overkill. And again, if you just got great players, guys, it don't matter. But for the, the schools that maybe don't have, you know, the best players, this stuff can really make a big difference. So that was a lot. And I talked really fast and I covered a great bit. And I think there's a lot more to it. So I would certainly encourage anybody to reach out to me. Again, my contact information is on every one of those slides. So as you're watching it, um, feel free to reach out. Um, like I, said, I can't guarantee I can respond in that second, but I will respond to you um, when the kids go to bed or, you know, when I've got some time on my hands, which I, I'm, I'm not sitting up here just, you know, doing virtual visits all day, you know, and all that stuff. So I'd love to talk about this. I enjoy talking about the football side of it um, just because I talk about it. doesn't mean we always do it. So I can't always say I have the best experience or we even do these things, but I like the mental side of the game. You know, people probably say it's, you know, you, you, know, you want to be simple and all that stuff, but then when simple doesn't work, well, what's your answers? Um, that's where I always kind of come around to it. So um, I'll kind of wrap up and say, I want to thank Nick for setting this up. I hope this reaches some coaches, especially down in the area. Um, I always, liked recruiting it the little bit that I did when I was um, at a different program. We used to recruit down there and you guys were always great to me. Um, but more than anything, I just want to talk football. Just certainly feel free to um, you know, reach out and uh, I'd love to kind of hear what you guys have to say on your guys end too. Um, we can talk about other things, whether it be run game or even dive into more protection and stuff like that. So stay safe out there, guys. I wish you guys all the best of your seasons. This is going to be unique. Um, we can talk today. We may get dropped a week in, showing up to campus as a staff and as a faculty and as players a week before camp, and we're going to figure it out and I'm in, let's do this. Um, life's got a funny way of throwing wrenches at you. I'd rather do football with one week of prep than no football with, you know, eight weeks of prep in my opinion. So um, I know you guys are, uh, are all preparing and doing a good job down there. So for anybody that, uh, you know, um, is getting ready to get cranked up, be safe out there, get those kids ready. Um, big believer in the game, keep those kids playing, especially at the youth level. You know, and I think there's two elements. You know, be smart on concussions, guys. You know, I think it's important. You know, we, we emphasize that nowadays. We want to keep kids playing, and especially parents. We want to keep them involved. And that, uh, you know, that's an element of keeping those kids' heads up when they're tackling and monitoring and understanding that, you know, he's got a concussion and he's out. And maybe it costs you a game. That's life. You know, as great tragedies in the world. But then number two, let those kids have some fun. You know, football's tough, especially for you varsity coaches. Hold those kids, you know, accountable. It's about winning. But let those kids have some fun, you know, every once in a while. And I'm sure you guys are probably all doing that. So that's my little uh, spiel there at the end, whether you want to hear it or not. Um, so wish you guys all the best. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm sure Nick will wrap this thing up and uh, take care, guys. And I certainly appreciate the time.